that print any easier for y'all to see? You can't tell the difference, can you, Terry? <laughs> I increased the font size just a little bit and uh, uh, moved the margin some so we can see it a little bit clearer. I got a call from Brother Mosier about an hour and a half or so ago, and Dorothy's not feeling well. <clears throat> and you know that she's going to be having uh, some very serious surgery in the not too distant future. I think it's about a week away. I can't remember the exact day. And uh, we need to keep them in our prayers. It's, um, um, it's, it's, well, it's very serious surgery. So keep her in your prayers. And then she'll, go, she'll come behind that with another surgery after that one heals to uh, deal with the cancer problem that she has. So keep both of them in your prayers and their family. I know they would appreciate it. We're going to be in John chapter 7 tonight for just a little while, verses 37 and following. I want to deal with something there that, uh, a passage that is really sort of a, well, I would say it's a difficult passage, and I think a lot of that difficulty comes because of preconceived notions and ideas, but I want to spend a little bit of time on that, and then we'll hasten to get through the material that we have. Um, Look, folks, when I say Mark dropped this class on me, I don't want you to get the impression I don't enjoy teaching this class. Uh, I tease him about that constantly. And for those of you that knew how close Mark and I were together and how close we grew over the uh, couple of years, two and a half years that he was here, um, what do they say? Good friends. They joke with each other a lot. Mark would say, well, I'd hate to see it if you hated me. <laughs> so, but I love the man, and, and I, I count it an honor to be able to fill in any way that I can. So don't, don't take that in the spirit in which it's given, would you? And don't, don't be spreading vicious rumors. <laughs> Let's bow to prayer on behalf, particularly the Mosiers, before we start. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your care for us and your concern about us and we don't understand why you love us so much but we're especially grateful for the privilege we have of interceding for our brothers and sisters in Christ and tonight we we pray especially for Keith and Dorothy and their family as Dorothy is about to face some very serious surgery we pray your a guiding hand upon the physicians that they'll use the wisdom and the knowledge that they have learned through the years and that their hands will be steady and that everything will be such that Sister Dorothy will regain her strength and you'll grant them a few more years to be in your service. We pray for all of those in the congregation who are suffering with illnesses uh, that your healing hand would be upon them. We pray for those who are suffering loss of loved ones, that you would comfort them and that you would use us as instruments in your hand to make sure others are doing well and to cheer them up and to encourage them as all of us travel together for that eternal home that awaits us. Pray that you'll be with us in our class tonight. Bless all the classes, the teachers, and may we study your word with the determination that we will apply these things to our life and live according to thy will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to focus on John 7. This is the last section down here. And this, this is still the Galilean ministry. And we're bringing this to a close. And one of the things I pointed out last week is that as Jesus moved toward Jerusalem in the Judean ministry, you remember that his brothers and his sisters, his family, wanted him to go up to Jerusalem and make himself known, manifest yourself, do signs, and show them that you are the Messiah. But really that desire on their part was another form of the same temptation that Satan used when he said to Jesus, cast yourself off the pinnacle, prove, your, prove to the people who you are, show a great sign. And uh, so Jesus told his family and his, his brothers that he would not go up to, to the feast at that time. And then he turns right around and he goes, but he goes in a roundabout way. He doesn't enter from the 
east side coming down the Mount of Olives, but instead it appears that he went up through Samaria and came across through Samaria down into maybe some out-of-the-way road or passage and entered into Jerusalem unannounced and in a non-public way to avoid uh, a premature arrest on the part of uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were seeking to destroy him. And that's where the story in Luke about the disciples of Jesus wanting to call down fire from heaven, particularly, you remember the zealot Simon and, and uh, James wanted to call down fire from, from heaven. And he passes through Samaria now and he enters into Jerusalem in a roundabout way. And then you come to the Feast of the Tabernacles, which you have at the beginning of chapter 7. And we touched on some of the things during the Feast of the Tabernacles. And this is drawing to a close. And uh, if you'll look on the board, he's passed through Samaria now. He's come to Jerusalem and really what this does is it, it ends the Galilean ministry and it starts what we call the later Judean ministry. And he's going to spend some time in and around Judea. And then after this portion of his earthly ministry comes to a close, he's going to leave Jerusalem again or leave Judea. And he's going to go over into Perea, which is on the east side of the Jordan, always in my estimation, always avoiding the conflict until, until God decided the time for the conflict was, was correct and on schedule. And uh, just repeatedly keep in my mind that it's not the Pharisees who are in control here, it's Christ who is in control. And even all the way through His trial, Jesus is the one who's in control. Now this is the later Judean ministry, and in 7, 11 through 52, you have Jesus at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And I think I pointed out last week that the Feast of the Tabernacles was basically one of the feasts of the Jews where they would move out of their houses and they'd lived in tents or booths. Sometimes they'd go on top of their house and they would build a booth to remind them of um, the wilderness wandering and how God cared for them. And so it was one of the national feasts that the Jews celebrated. And it is toward the later part of this Feast of the Tabernacles when you get to chapter 7, about verse 37. He, he's already started crying out publicly uh, with regard to His Messiahship. He's making known that He is indeed the Messiah. But look at verse 37 and following, if you will. On the last day, John 7, verse 37, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Um, it, it, I'm trying to figure out the best way to approach this. Um, there are varying views on the Holy Spirit, and we've managed to not break fellowship over these different views on the Holy Spirit because uh, we have generally understood that the power of God comes through the Word. The Word is all-sufficient. And there are passages that surely indicate that and teach that clearly. 2 Timothy 3, 16 uh, and 17 is one of the best passages. Every scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaches me what I need to do. For reproof, it shows me where I'm wrong. For instruction which is in righteousness, it shows me how to correct where I'm wrong and uh, I'm sorry, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, shows me how to correct my wrong, and then for instruction in righteousness, which shows me how to maintain Christian living. And those different purposes in the Word are scattered throughout the epistles, the gospel accounts. That's the basic thrust of, of inspired Scripture. But then in that passage in 2 Timothy, Paul finishes that by saying that the man of God may be, and the King James, I think, says perfect. American Standard says complete. Uh, the word there has more the idea of maturity or completeness and maturity. Uh, the word is able to bring me to, to fullness, to the mature man that I ought to be, spiritually speaking. And there's no other source that God uses for salvation. 
the, we've been studying in Romans in Brother Greg's class. The gospel is the what? Power unto what? The power unto salvation. And it comes through His Word. I don't always understand how that happens, but uh, I think the all-sufficiency of the Word is clearly taught in 2 Timothy 3.16 and others. Now, we have basically managed to maintain fellowship in, despite all the different views on the Holy Spirit. And basically there are two or three different views. One of these is that the gift of the Holy Spirit or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is uh, some kind of a personal indwelling by the Holy Spirit Himself. And then another is that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the plan of salvation or salvation that God gives to you. And uh, I happen to think that Acts chapter 2 verse 38, the gift of the Spirit there is the miraculous endowments. Uh, and whether you accept that or not doesn't change what you have in, in John chapter 7. Because the Scripture does not contradict itself. So I have to try to find a way somehow to harmonize those things. And I thought I'd take just a minute and maybe refresh our memory with regard to the miraculous endowments and uh, how those were given and uh, how those play out and what role they play in my understanding of John chapter 7. And I'm doing this not to... I, I can't park on every scripture in our survey of the life of Christ, but I think this is one that is important enough to at least spend a few minutes on it. So we're going to do this tonight and then continue our journey with Christ. Turn over to Mark chapter 16 for a moment. And I think I'm speaking to an audience that generally understands the age of the miraculous ceased when all the apostles had died and all those on whom they had laid their hands had died, then the miraculous by necessity would have ceased. I draw that conclusion from uh, Luke's uh, observation in uh, Acts chapter 8. You remember when Peter and John were called down from Jerusalem to give the gifts unto the brethren there, and it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that those gifts were given. Well, I mean, just common sense tells me. If that's how the gifts were given, then it would make sense that when the apostles died and all those upon whom they had laid their hands had died, the, the, the miraculous endowments would cease. Uh, that was even expected. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, he dealt with the miraculous gifts and chapter 13 is a wonderful expose, not just of love, and, and it is. It's a great chapter on love. But the purpose in that chapter is to show the superiority of love over gifts. Love was permanent. Gifts were temporary. And he refers to various gifts in there, whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, that's the gift of knowledge. Uh, it shall be done away. And so I think we understand, the audience that I'm talking to tonight understands that, but sometimes there are passages that give you some problems, uh, and sometimes our Pentecostal friends will throw these at us, and uh, we're not real sure how to answer them. So I want to I take a minute and look at a couple of passages, and then go back to John chapter 7, and maybe you can see how these dovetail together and tie together. I'm looking at uh, Mark 16. Well, you know the Great Commission in verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Watch the personal pronoun there. He that believeth, that's indiv individual. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now watch verse 17. And these signs shall accompany them. This is a package thing. It would accompany them, all them. That's the church. It would accompany the church, if you will, which is those that believe. In my name, they're going to do what? Cast out demons. Uh, they shall speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents, verse 18. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall in no wise hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. He's describing what the church as a whole would have, and that is the miraculous endowments. Why did they need those miraculous endowments? It's because they didn't have what you and I hold in our hand tonight. It wasn't imprinted for them. The truth was in the apostles. It was in inspired men. And as those men put these things into print, there would be no need to further confirm what was being said. But look, if you will, at verses 19 and 20. Same passage. So then the Lord Jesus, after He had spoken unto them, was received up into heaven 
sat down at the right hand of God, and they, that is the church, went forth uh, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, with the church, and confirming the word by the signs that followed. And we, we don't have any difficulty with that because we understand that this is the church as a whole. What is conspicuously absent in Mark 16 is any reference as to how the miraculous endowments were given or how long those endowments were to last. So be careful when you're studying Mark 16 that you don't read into this passage something that's not there. Our Pentecostal friends will tell you, you see, this, the miraculous was designed for everybody, every individual throughout the age of the church. But you can't find that in Mark 16. See how Scripture harmonizes together? Let me show you another one that is often used. Turn over to Acts chapter 5. And you have to remember that you're looking at the church that, is, that came into existence and in the first century, the lives of all these and that we're reading about here was in the backdrop of the miraculous endowments. That's the way they would have understood references to the Holy Spirit. Now when you get to Acts chapter 5 and verse 28 and following, you remember the apostles were... Well, look at verse 28, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in the name, and behold, you fill Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Let me pause right there. You remember what the Jews said when Jesus was before Pilate? Crucify him. What shall I do? Crucify him. Uh, his blood be upon our heads. And now they don't want the blood of Christ to be on their heads. So you, you get an example of hypocrisy in that. So verse 29, Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew, hanging him on a tree. Him did God exalt with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and remission of sins. And we, that is the apostles, we are witnesses of one another, gift to another. Some just didn't have any gifts at all. So they were distributed according to God's wisdom and the use. Uh, now let's go to John chapter 7 again. And let me kind of show you how this ties in. I'm, 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 I'm seeing an image here of the church in the first century that had the miraculous endowments. Now I'm just going to call your attention to a passage in Joel. I wish I had the time to just go over there and study it. But you remember that Peter quoted from Joel 2 and verse 28 when he said, This is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And I suggest to you that in Joel 28 and 29 that you have, a, you have a composite concept of the entire Christian dispensation. That the Spirit would come, that's the beginning of the Christian age, and those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, that's the judgment day. And those passages between those two statements is a reference to the Christian dispensation, the whole of it. And basically you have the same thought here in John chapter 7. Now, let's take a close look at this. And I want to begin with verse 30. In fact, I want to begin at the last part of verse 39. And I want to work my way back through the passage and try to tie this in with the passages we've just studied. There's something said in verse 39 about Jesus being glorified. Jesus being glorified. Glorified. I want you to concentrate on that for just a moment. And I want to look at some passages that help me to get an understanding of when, precisely when was Jesus glorified. And there are statements that suggest that as Jesus came to the end of His life, He's lived a perfect life. He's lived a sinless life. And now He is in the process of the last week, which we will be getting to in short order on our survey of the ministry of Christ. He's... He's entering this Passion Week, which would end up in His death, His burial, His resurrection, and then the meeting with His apostles, and ultimately His ascension back into heaven. Everything was coming to a close. Everything was culminating in this precise week. Turn over to John chapter 12, and read with me, start, starting with verse 20. Now this is later... Remember, this is later in the ministry of Christ. We're past the Feast of Tabernacles now. 
And you're very close to Jesus entering into the upper room with His disciples, which comes in John chapter 13. So this is very close to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Everything is in place. Now look at verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those that went up to worship at the feast. This would have been the Passover here, not the Feast of Tabernacles. We're past that. These therefore came to Philip, who was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now let's pause right there for a minute. Jesus said, I was not... I, I was sent to the house of Israel. That was, the, that was the, the limited commission. They went to the house of Israel first. And here are Greeks now who are wanting to see Jesus. They're coming to investigate. So we would see Jesus, they say, in verse, the last part of verse 22. And Philip comes and he tells Andrew. And Andrew comes and Philip, and they tell Jesus, and Jesus answered them, saying, now here's an interesting phrase, the hour is come. The hour is come. You remember when Jesus started His earthly ministry in John chapter 2, and His mother said, the wine has failed? And Jesus said something to the extent, oh, why do you trouble me? My time is not yet. You see that terminology in one form or another, used quite frequently through the gospel accounts. But now you're arriving at the ultimate, uh, the Passion Week, the ultimate moment when everything is coming to a head and the scheme of redemption is going to be fulfilled. And Jesus answered and said, "My hour, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be what? What's the word that you have there? Glorified. The hour is here for Him to be glorified. So when I started back there in John 7, and I'm looking at when Jesus was glorified, something is about to happen now that Jesus is glorified. But really, there's more to that glorification than just opening the door of opportunity to Gentiles. Turn over to John chapter 15, if you will. Is that what I want? Let's see, John 16. John 16. And I want to start with verse 7 and just read with me a little bit. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. He's with His disciples. And He's telling them about His departure. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send Him unto you. I think we... I mean, I'm speaking to an audience that understands this is the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that would be sent. Verse 8, And He, when He has come, will convict the world in respect of sin and righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on Me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and you behold Me no more, of judgment because the Prince of the world has been judged. And I have yet many things to say unto you, but... You cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when He the Spirit has come, I'll pay close attention to the next two or three verses. When He the Spirit of truth has come, He shall guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak from Himself, but what things soever He shall hear, these shall He speak, and He shall declare unto you the things that are come. He shall do what? He shall glorify me. The glorification of Jesus began when He entered into those last few days upon this earth. And it extended beyond His death, His burial, and His resurrection into the miraculous age in which the Holy Spirit was leading them into all truth and glorifying Christ. Now once the Word is given, how do we glorify Christ today? We preach the Word, do we not? We uphold Him. We lift Him up. We glorify Him. But in these passages that we're looking at, there is a, there's a time frame here that encompasses the final week, the Passion Week, all the way through His resurrection, into His ascension, and the revelation of the full gospel starting in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost and encompassing the divine revelation and the recording of that revelation and ultimately putting it into print. Okay, Brother Epifanio, you following me so far? Okay, if you can follow me, anybody can, all right? <laughs> now let's go back to John chapter 7. Remember I said we're starting at the back and going forward. So he's making this statement in the last part of verse 39, Jesus was not yet glorified. Now let's read the rest of 39. 
But this spake he, we're going to talk about what he spoke about in just a moment. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him were to receive. Here's this encompassing pronoun, they. They, the church, would receive the Spirit. They would receive the miraculous endowments that would guide the apostles into all the truth through their apostleship, but pass that gift of inspiration on to others who would write through the laying on of the apostles' hands. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given. It would be given in Acts chapter 2 when the day of Pentecost began, and particularly in Acts 8 when gifts were given unto men. So I know there's something that was going to occur. This, this is going to go back up into verse 38 now. But just capture 39 and how it fits into all the other passages we've talked about. I really believe that this 39th verse is not a description of you and I preaching the gospel in our non-miraculous age. Because Jesus was glorified a long time ago, and that Spirit was given when He was glorified. Now let's go back up into verse 37 and 38, and let's see how He describes this in highly figurative language. What is going to be an actual fact in verse 39? Start with verse 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the Scripture has said. I don't know where this Scripture is, by the way. It's not, there's, no, there's no quote out of Scripture. It's probably a combination of two or three Old Testament passages that liken to God and to living streams, but this precise language doesn't exist. It's just a general idea. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. So out of somebody or some person or some group of people would come these living waters. Does Jesus explain what these living waters are? Yes, He does in the very next verse. But this He spake of the Spirit which was to be given. So here's my conclusion on this. I think verse 37 and 38 is talking about the miraculous endowment, probably even the first uh, uh, appointment of the apostles in the receiving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and their, their being commissioned as God's spokesman. And it would be out of them, out of them would come these living waters, not from their own thoughts or their own minds, but from the gift of the Holy Spirit that was in them, this, this inspiration that was given to the apostles. And even Peter said a, a principle that applied to the Old Testament, but I think it's just as true of the New Testament. No, no prophecy is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were what? What, Ted? As they were moved by what? The Holy Spirit. And that's a reference to men who were speaking by divine inspiration. So this passage, though, if you read it, if you're not careful and you don't take into account all the other passages in the New Testament, it might leave the impression that somehow this is the Spirit working on all of us in some sort of a direct manner. In fact, one brother who went off into the direct operation of the Holy Spirit years and years ago, he thought this was his sugar passage. This is it. This proves my doctrine that the Holy Spirit operates directly on all of us. And I wrote an article on that, sent it into one of the publications, sent a copy to him, never got a response, never been answered. Now let me stop there. Maybe now if you ask a question or speak up or make comment, keep in mind, I may have to ask you a couple of times, but speak up loud enough and be glad to hear what you have to say. Or did you follow me? Did y'all follow me? Is that it? Is that I mean, that's not difficult to understand, at least I don't think it is. Maybe I'll think too simply. <laughs> Men make things complicated, not God. And if you just allow passages to harmonize, you're, you're in pretty good shape. Anybody got a comment? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to jump down your throat. I mean, if I'm wrong, I'd like to know if I'm wrong. Like deer looking into the online, oncoming lights of a car at them. Well, let's move on then. Since there's no disagreement or any problem with that, 
uh, as, I, as you move now, he's now in the area of Judea. This is why we call this the later Judean ministry. And there are several things that are going to unfold. This is the Feast of the Tabernacle. The Tabernacles actually takes place in this, this later uh, Judean ministry. Here's one passage, one event, and the closing part of chapter 7 and on into chapter 8 that everybody likes to jump on because they think it teaches things it does not teach. As if to say, Jesus never did condemn the lady. He just said, don't go thy way and sin no more. She couldn't stay in sin. Read with me a little bit, starting with verse... Uh, well, let's back up into chapter 7, verse uh, 52, all right? Because actually, the divisions are man-made divisions. And I think you grasp the, the concept of what's taking place here if you back up into chapter 7. Verse 52, They answered and said, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and see that out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And they went every man unto his own house. Now, my American standard has a bracket at chapter eight and verse uh, uh, chapter seven and verse fifty three, and then a closing bracket at chapter eight and verse eleven, which their uh, conclusion was that this is not this passage doesn't belong there because of different manuscripts. I think it belongs here. I think it was written by divine inspiration. I think it's an accurate account. But let's suppose for a moment that it's that it was inserted here by a scribe from some other place in divine inspiration or in the scriptures, it, it still fits. And whether it belongs here or somewhere else, it's still biblical teaching. There's nothing in it to suggest it's kind of a fabrication or a make-believe incident or some fanciful, fan, fanciful fairy tale or anything like that. But let's see what happens. It gives you a wonderful portrayal of Jesus' tenderness in dealing with those caught up in sin. They went every man to his own house, but Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. So he goes to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he comes again into the temple. And all the people came to him. He sat down, he taught them, the scribes and the Pharisees, bring a woman taken in adultery and having set her in the midst. Now these Pharisees, they could care less of restoring this woman. They're trying to use her as a point of contention to somehow entrap Jesus. And they were good at that. I mean, they sought that constantly. They said unto him, Teacher, can you almost see the arrogance? Teacher, we're going to throw something at you you can't answer. They said, Teacher, this woman has been taken in adultery in the very act. Let me stop there. What strikes you about this whole incident? If she was caught in the very act, where was the man? If she's caught in the very act, where was the man? So already you know they have no intention of exercising, you know, the Mosaic law and what it said about being in adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such. What then sayest thou of her? And this they said, trying him. You see, no intentions for getting at justice. They were testing Jesus, that they might have whereof to accuse him, that is Jesus, and thereby discredit him, and maybe even find an excuse to stone him. That was their motive. You know, when you, there's a great lesson in this. When you reach the point where you're looking at Scripture to prove a point, now be careful here. I don't mean to substantiate the truth of a point. I mean, when you're looking at Scripture or looking through Scripture to prove a preconceived idea, you're treading on mighty dangerous ground. And basically, when you look at all the error in the religious world, uh, they do. They twist Scriptures and they don't harmonize them. I had a fellow that used to drink coffee with us in downtown Ada. He was a member of... Uh, I think the Baptist church, and we would discuss things off and on, and he came into the coffee shop one day, and he said, Brother Waycaster, and I'd always tell him, I'm not your brother. How can people be brothers if they're not united? And he always called me Brother Waycaster. And then he'd say, I found a passage that kills Mark 16 and verse 16. I said, kills it? I said, look, passages don't kill each other. If you find a passage that's at such animosity with another, you think it kills one, you, you fail to harmonize them. Truth harmonizes. Truth doesn't contradict. Otherwise, you never know what truth is, okay? 
So, uh, in this particular incident here, they're trying to entrap him. Look at verse uh, 6, middle of this. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. This is the only example I ever have of Jesus writing anything. He's, I think he's just doodling on the ground. Maybe writing a scripture, we'll never know. But when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Actually, when people were caught in uh, any sin that demanded the death penalty, the one who was the witness or brought the accusation has to be the first one to cast the stone. You see what Jesus is saying? In your midst is the one whom you're accusing having adultery, but you're not punishing him. Let him cast the first stone. And again he stooped down, and with his finger he wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, went out one by one, beginning from the eldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman where she was in the midst. And Jesus lifted up himself and said, Woman, where are they? No man condemns thee. Did no man condemn thee? And she said, No man. And the Lord said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way. The reason he didn't condemn her is because he was giving her the opportunity to repent. What if she had refused to repent? She would have stood self-condemned. Jesus came as a Savior in this life. He'll come as the judge in his second coming. And all judgment will be given to him. And he's giving her an opportunity. Is that the first bell? He's giving her the opportunity to make things correct in her life. And uh, so he, had, he encouraged her, go thy way and sin no more. That's what God says to us when we obey the gospel. Have you ever thought about that? He's given the avenue for forgiveness. Hear, believe, repent. I'm getting you into your sermon now, Brother Epiphanius. Hear, believe, repent, confess, obey the gospel. Now, what do you do? Go and sin no more. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, scheme that says there is a way to deal with sin, and God has graciously brought that to us. Let me just uh, show you where we're going. We're going to look at the sermon, of, uh, the sermon of Jesus being the light of the world, and then we're going to look at Jesus healing a man born blind, and then the sermon of the Good Shepherd next week as we uh, do our best to trot along. <laughs>